Like so many of the videos I want to do, I'm gonna have to do a very much truncated version of this. Um, I'm planting chestnuts and I've got that uh, crown right at the soil line. The roots are trimmed just so that they'll basically be uh, more or less straight the way that they were growing. And the reason I'm always rushing videos like this is because I don't want to dry the roots out at all. So just for the sake of a silly little video, I don't want to ruin these or stress the roots out at all. But anyway, now that it's covered with a little bit of soil um, and the plants, the other plants here are surrounded by burlap, it's moist. It's not super sunny, but the sun is coming out momentarily. So I want to get these in as fast as possible. Anyway, I loosened up two rows with my excavator, which was, I would say overkill, but actually it's not overkill. It's awesome. Um, the thing is, this trench is loosened to like two feet and it makes digging, you know, I, I dig each hole in 30 seconds, which is really wonderful. And um, I didn't anticipate ever having to dig in here again, but I realized I want to really get a lot more diversity into this field. And so this planting is going to be chestnuts, which are going to be an overstory over the persimmons with some little bit of shade coming through. Um, but at the density that we're at here, which is 25 feet between rows, um, I'm going to be able to squeeze some chestnuts in here and not totally shade out the persimmons. And um, I'm only putting one every 10 meters. So we've got plenty of space on the, on the chestnuts. I'm going to train them up to be very tall. And um, we're going to work, yeah, they're going to work with the persimmons in terms of shade and light requirements and all that. And then in between, we're going to do a strawberry um, ground cover and then probably some bushes. Everything's going to be in straight row, uh, all in one row, what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to get to planting here, but then I'll do an update once it's done. Essentially, this row is going to have final spacing chestnuts as well as some nitrogen fixers, a shrub layer, a ground cover layer, but it's all going to be in one very, very narrow row, so it's going to be super easy to manage. I'll show you how it's how it looks when it's done. A little bit later in the day, and um, things are in the ground, so it's not quite as much of a rush, although I still need to mulch it, which is a fairly big rush. Anyway, um, so a little bit of context. The persimmon rows are more or less north-south, uh, there's persimmons and pawpaws and one random peach and they've been in for eight years they've been bearing for three or four years and um, i had initially grown vegetables in the middle here and there's rows of asparagus on either side of this bed and the other one and that's still there and they should pop up any day now they're a little bit late here because um, I let the uh, grass and stuff grow around them so that slows them down because it doesn't um, the soil doesn't warm up very fast so they're a little behind normal or whatever maybe this is normal until the asparagus comes up earlier than normal anyway um, so I used to have veggies here and I wanted to put in some canopy trees that would overtop the persimmons um, but provide not too much shade to prevent them from fruiting. So I, I found that they can withstand, you know, 30%, 40% shade, which I won't even get them that much and still fruit pretty well. So I was able to pop in these like really nice chestnuts that are, you know, seven feet tall, eight feet tall, um, every 10 meters. And then in between, can't really see everything right now, but essentially the pattern is 
in between chestnuts, there are two nitrogen fixers, a red bud and right, there's a low nitrogen fixing and an amorpha, high nitrogen fixing. Um, different flower times, totally different growth habits. And then um, there are also shell bark hickories, just to make sure we've got nuts in case something dies. And then there are pawpaws and black currants that are going to shade the pawpaw. So here's a little pawpaw and the black currant is going to shade the pawpaw. Um, that's the amorpha. And it's still going to get denser, so there's going to be eventually a tree every foot or so. A tree or shrub every foot. And then on this one, I've already started popping in the center ground cover, which is these strawberries. So there's a strawberry every eight inches or so. And so, oh, and then I've got a few... Um, poplar, hybrid poplar, and that's a crossover species between ecto and endomycorrhiza, also great biomass um, species. And so all of the, the woody species are right down the center in one exact line. So when I need to mow, I can mow really tight. And then even the strawberries are in the center line. And the only thing that I might plant on the outsides of that center line are some annual veggies maybe like a row of bush beans or something pretty simple um, because I just want to keep the management really, really streamlined and simple. So I can mow on the sides and this is all going to be mulched and then maybe two lines of veggies on the outside. And that way at the end of the year, um, you know, because there's, there's plenty of rowdy herbaceous weeds in here, mugwort, um, a lot of stoloniferous grasses, so they're gonna creep in eventually. And, you know, if I had more plant material right now, I probably would put more stuff in the sides. Um, I'd love to have some rhubarb, but I don't have enough rhubarb right now. And uh, more comfrey, but I'm all out of roots and I don't wanna dig any more up right now. So I'm sort of stuck. Um, I probably will put in either beans and or some pretty fast growing cover um, on the sides, like maybe um, maybe some mar Mexican marigold, tithonia, something that's really gonna be like an herbaceous biomass on the side that'll help mulch it out. And I am gonna bring in some mulch um, to prevent this soil from super drying out. But, and then um, the ongoing management is really gonna be for strawberries for this year and then heading right towards chestnuts as soon as possible so the other stuff is all pretty much support trees for the chestnuts and then so pop, uh, the pawpaws are going to be um, just an in-line understory of the chestnut and there might there might be some other stuff but this is sort of um, the chestnuts were the main thing that I wanted to interplant with the persimmons and then everything else is sort of to support them and to get benefits from what they do to the soil. So I'll definitely update as the season goes on. I'm pretty excited. I've actually, this is one of the great benefits of having your own nursery. And this is why I started growing nursery stuff because you can go from nothing to seven foot trees all of a sudden. And I could have done twice this density. I have so many, I got trees coming out of my ears. So it's just like, you can plant um, as dense as you want. Otherwise you, you know, I could never have afforded doing things like this. Um, that's actually why I started the nursery in the first place. And now it's kind of coming to fruition where I can envision these plantings. Uh, one other quick note, the reason that I was able to do all of this planting, including those strawberries, all these trees in two hours is because that machine in the background I used to dig the beds. So they're just fluff down to like two feet. Um, so I pretty much, uh, I didn't get a, a video of it, but I pretty much just reached in with the bucket, sunk it, and then just moved it back a little bit and then came up and did the next chunk. So it was sort of like that. So I really didn't flip anything. I didn't invert any soil layers. So all the topsoil is still on top, 
very clear stratification to the subsoil. And, um, you know, it was pretty heavy duty, but that thing actually has pretty low ground pressure. So I didn't even really compact. You, you can't even really see any imprint where I, where I had to walk it down with the, you know, the machine. It's, it doesn't do that much. And for the decompaction that I got here, it was unbelievable. I had started with a broad fork and um, I just have too much going on right now and too much physical labor and doing the broad forking on this pretty heavy soil was gonna take forever and be very tough and I had the machine up there so I figured maybe I'll see what this is like and my god, i <laughs> very happy with that decision. Um, it makes planting these big trees with big root systems just like, I mean, 30 seconds to dig the hole, put it in, loose soil to backfill. Um, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. I think, honestly, if I was going to do big plantings in the future, uh, sure there's other ways to do it, but that just leaves a really loose, nice seed bed um, for planting. And that part usually takes quite a bit longer. I mean, if this soil was any more compact, I would have not been able to accomplish what I did this morning. Um, so yeah, so the next step is to mulch that, plant some veggies on the sides, and then um, maybe maybe some pruning. Depends on how things grow this season. Anyway, I'll check back in once things start growing and it all gets up and running. So halfway through mulching, here's my mulching rig. Um, normally I would use a wheelbarrow, but this is a little bit larger than what I want to do considering how far away the chips are. So here I can move, um, this bucket takes about two wheelbarrows plus full, and this uh, box takes about another four-ish. So I can do six at once. You can fill that thing with the tractor. Um, so this could be done in many different ways. You can have obviously wheelbarrow and, and um, uh, hay fork, um, or you could have one of those cool like pull behind um, like gorilla carts that have four wheels that are really maneuverable. Um, I would prefer a trailer on the back of this so that I could get a little bit more wood chips and it wasn't on the, um, the three point hitch, but either way, it allows me to move quite a bit of mulch pretty quickly. So I'm halfway done. Got the other row to do over there, but I have to plant the ground cover strawberries on that one first. Um, couple quick notes. Basically, you wanna start with the biggest trees first and then go in with small trees and then do ground cover and then um, stick anything that you're gonna do cuttings. That's more or less the order, um, you know, bas basically, well, probably a better way to say it is you wanna go from the greatest disturbance planting to the least disturbance planting, if that makes sense. So you have to dig a big hole for this big tree, do those first, and then the last thing on, on the ground cover, I planted a strawberry basically less than every foot. So I wanted to do that pretty much last or second to last um, while you still have the space. Cause then if you want to plant in one line and you've got something every foot, then after that it kind of closes up and you can't really easily plant anything. So do the wide spacing stuff first, the big, um, big root balls first, and then slowly work your way to smaller and smaller until you do the ground cover and maybe um, like the black currants were direct stuck rooted just started to root cuttings um, just kind of makes it a little bit quicker to to work with so we've got some of the trees are obvious there's lots of trees in there that you can't quite see the little pawpaws little shag bark shell bark northern hardy pecan um, nitrogen fixers you can see it's all kinds of nuts in here basically just insurance policy so if the some of the chestnuts don't take or if they get girdled by voles or 
rubbed by deer or whatever, um, some nut will be there to, to come up and replace them. Although the chestnuts at this point, even if the top got destroyed, they probably would, uh, would send up a stump sprout and be back up within another year or two. So the center line is all planted out. And as the temperatures get a little bit warmer, I'll probably put in veggie transplants and or direct seed beans onto the sides. And then um, same thing on the other one. And this project will be essentially done for a while. The only other thing I'll probably do this season, like I said, is maybe a little follow-up pruning depending on if some of the nitrogen fixers or um, if any of the trees start to grow really, really crazy and start to shade out some of the other stuff, then I'll just manage just a tiny little bit. But in this first establishment year, I probably won't have to do all that much other than manage the herbaceous uh, layer on the sides. A couple other thoughts. The wood chips that I have, it happens to be from a, uh, an old spruce tree that fell down and I had left the branches in a pile. They helped establish some trees and then I moved them on and we chipped them. And there was some other stuff mixed into that, some deciduous twiggy stuff, but for the majority of this is um, pine and spruce branches. So that's not the best. Um, you know, this is not a great wood chip to establish deciduous trees, but it is what I have. So there's that. But it's much better, in my opinion, than um, bare soil. Like, that's not even a comparison. But the problem is that they do encourage different communities of fungi and not necessarily the ones we'd be most excited about or the deciduous trees would be most excited about. But for the most part, they also just have the, the physical property of preventing the sun from hitting the soil, keeping moisture in. So it might not be the ideal fungal situation, but it is certainly in every other way, uh, well, you get the benefits of how mulch as opposed to nothing. So um, in this case, it's just what I had. And also I would, like, uh, I would have liked a lot to put quite a bit more down. I have probably about an inch, an inch and a half over most of this bed, which, you know, I'd like two or more, but I would say we're definitely gonna see some of the grasses start to creep in, although not that not as much as you'd think because on this side it's largely orchard grass which is really not stoloniferous it's more of a bunching grass so the grass isn't going to intrude that much there's some areas where there's mugwort which, which will intrude a little bit but i'll keep that mown to the side um, as i said a barrier planting of of comfrey or something like that would be really good but i don't have it right now so i'm going to do uh, i actually started a whole lot of seeds of tithonia so i'm going to do veggies to start and then tithonia will take it over and um, kind of serve as the barrier for the rest of the season. So um, yeah, if you could get more mulch, that would be good. If you could get, you know, ramiel wood chip mulch from deciduous trees, that'd be perfect, ideal, but you know, and then there's reality. So anyway, yeah, cause I've, uh, I've heard from people that, oh, you shouldn't use pine wood chip um, mulch cause it'll do the wrong thing. but it does most of the right things and maybe isn't the best possible thing, but it's certainly good enough for getting a new um, row of trees established. One final, final thought. Here's uh, some of the older pawpaws just about to open up the flowers. Very beautiful flower, kind of somber in a way. And the persimmons have a little ways to go until they start waking up. Why am I doing it this way? Well, mostly because you keep learning as you, as you grow, and I would have done it this way to start with if I knew what I was doing at the time that I established this orchard. Um, I had started the persimmon and pawpaw trees to plant out here a very long time ago, two years before we even bought this place, before we knew we were gonna have a farm. Um, of this size that was just I had started a nursery so I was just doing it 
and then we got this and I had the trees and I was excited and I put them in and I didn't really do enough planting at that time. I did interplant these rows, but it was just with strawberries. I didn't put in any nitrogen fixers. I seeded some clover, so that's not entirely true, but I thought I had actually spoken with Jerry Lehman, who is, was one of the great uh, persimmon advocates of North America. He's passed away. Um, but he told me plant on a 20 by 20 or 20 by 25 for ease of management. So I did that, I followed his advice and I grew vegetables in between, we had the asparagus and then eventually it all got so complicated and I said, I'm just gonna mow this. And then I had thought maybe I'll eventually put sheep in there, but I'm not gonna do livestock. Um, life is already busy enough and I have other things to worry about. And if I were gonna do it again, I would keep basically the same spacing. Well, if I were gonna do it again, I am doing it again. But if I would have done it with this kind of mindset that I have now the first time, I would have kept this very wide spacing, very generous spacing on the persimmon trees. They haven't even come close to touching crown, um, crowns to crowns after eight years in the ground. And I could right now, if I had known better, have a beautiful tall biomass tree in the middle here or uh, maybe it would be a chestnut or something, but I could certainly have done a multi-strata, multi-level planting. So maybe I wouldn't have had a chestnut every other persimmon, but maybe every second one like I'm doing now, I could have put a chestnut in that would have gotten up, had a primary canopy um, of chestnut and then persimmon or, uh, yeah, and then I should have had some woody nitrogen fixers for sure. And I just didn't have nearly as much diversity as I, as I would like to. And I didn't have enough biomass. So this system here, this orchard is probably essentially starving. Um, it doesn't look like it, you know, the persimmons are producing food. It's great. It feels very abundant when they're in fruit, but it's not producing enough fertility to really sustain an extraction of fruit every year indefinitely. And the soil will probably, the soil has actually become quite compact. Um, you know, it had been a full tillage annual crop before I bought the farm for years. So it was very impoverished soil. I mean, tilled probably realistically the way they grew lettuce, probably eight to 10 times a year, the soil was disturbed for decades. So really pretty beat down. And essentially I fluffed it up and planted and I did mulch it really heavily the first few years, but all the mulch is gone now and I didn't put enough living roots in the ground to sustain the nitrogen fixation, to sustain enough carbon fixation, to put enough woody biomass on the ground to keep the soil life improving and diversifying. So it, the system had become very simple with just forbs, grasses, and trees of, of two species. And so what we need now is to get way more diversity in, way more tree roots in, more shade to the ground level, and a lot more woody biomass turning over every year. So that's the goal here. And that's why I'm doing it in this kind of weird way of, of starting afresh in between rows eight years in.